the field of regenerative thinking and um, through forming this design collective with Melissa, who's also joined us from Pittsburgh today. And um, the conceptualizing this design tool that I'll share more about as an opportunity to better understand how to translate some of the theories around regenerative practices into tangible action. So definitely uh, um, not <laughs> an expert at all. And that the intent of tonight was really just to share some of the information that I've gathered so far and then have a very um, proactive conversation about developing uh, possible, you know, brainstorming from all the, love to hear from all of you, your ideas that you may have on how to actualize some type of tool that could help facilitate more around regenerative practices. So um, for my presentation, another um, sub agenda within the broader agenda is just going to go over some um, aspects of regenerative thinking and then introduce the design tool and then have a breakout session for, I'm not sure how long, Kaylin, that that will be, like 15, 20 minutes or so. Yeah, we'll fill it out, about, about that long. Okay, okay, and all of the slides will also be available to you in the breakout room as reference. So I know I'll be going through quite a bit, but um, please feel free to ask additional questions in the chat regarding, or also you'll have the slides um, to reference. Uh, for the brainstorming session. So real brief about uh, Mobius Collective uh, recently formed. The idea was um, to really connect what's um, happening within human-centered design and all the evolution taking place in that space and integrate it with sustainability planning, earth-centered design, or now really what's um, more people are embracing is regenerative context-based solutions. So how you can better understand what the immediate needs are within that localized community, helping to facilitate action sessions. So um, really, again, being able to translate the theoretical into tangible solutions, helping to do holistic thinking and broader um, problem mapping. And then also really looking again at a, at a broad range of solutions, um, whether that be tech-based, program-based, whatever it may be, product-based, uh, to help more individuals and organizations move towards regenerative practices. And so just briefly about myself, uh, background in environmental planning, and then also in sustainability planning. And then about five years ago, I launched Nature Commode. And um, some of you may have been at an event in the Portland area, or you might have uh, had an opportunity to try one of our Nature Commodes. So the intent of this company was really to test the ability of design and use direct user experience to transform public attitudes about ecological sanitation and nutrient cycling. And so really the toilets were intended both from a utilitarian standpoint to provide sanitation services, but also as a tool for engaging the public to one, have a really positive experience in, um, in a compost toilet, and then two, to embark in that conversation of thinking about their contribution instead of from a negative uh, standpoints that's so writ with so many cultural taboos to really a uh, positive uh, support for utilization of the collected um, re uh, material as a resource. And so really wanted to take that experience now further into broader regenerative uh, practices. So just briefly about the regenerative design tool concept was recently learning much more about platform design. I'm new to it, but thinking that there's some opportunities within kind of some emerging conversations regarding platform development that could help facilitate regenerative practices. But what could that look like? What could be the components? How could it still be designed from an open source standpoint, um, but allow continual evolution? Um, how could it be easy for any user to use that would provide um, very clear visuals with a dashboard helping with tracking and reporting um, at the same time also provide maybe different levels of entry or performance such as they have within lead. Um, so all this is just kind of some initial thoughts and that's where really opening it up to the group today to hear from all of you ideas that you may have about what should be included within the tool, but also areas of concern that you may see from developing such a tool from your own areas of expertise. And I'll go into this in greater detail. First, um, just get into sharing a little bit more about uh, regenerative thinking and practice. There are such a broad conversation 
happening, very active conversation happening today about regenerative thinking, I think especially driven by um, our experience with the pandemic and wanting to emerge out of this better than we were before. And so um, there's many definitions out there. The one that I thought worked for me to kind of explain exactly what regenerative practices should be is you know, building the capacity and capability in people, communities, and natural systems to renew, evolve, and thrive, and essentially making it better than you found it. So it's the idea that every actor within the project or in the space and all of the inputs are contributing positively to the ecosystem to make it even thrive even more. So it's really moving from that, also from a linear based system to more of a cyclical flow. And that's in terms of the resources, energy, and also just the consideration within a broader ecosystem. It also really centers around this idea of inner being, which is a term coined by uh, Tigna Hat, Tigna, excuse me, the mispronunciation, Tigna Han, about um, the idea that all phenomena depend on and interexist with each other. So this was a, a diagram developed by the IFF, and I'm trying to modify it and looking at like all the different domains that may already have relationships with each, with each other, but we don't often see that visibility between them and understand that um, impact that um, one, uh, an effort in one area such as governance may then have on non-humans or on ecosystem function or certainly in health and so forth. And so part of what I really appreciate about what's going on within the design thinking, uh, regenerative thinking space is that how can we have uh, better tools to help facilitate not just a clear understanding of what we need to consider within projects. And again, emphasizing that whole systems approach, but also how to help increase that visibility and strengthen the connectivity between seemingly desperate nodes. This is uh, yet another model that helps to articulate about the dis distinguishing regenerative and relationship to sustainable. So having been in sustainability planning and often seeing that that was the desired destination to arrive at, but always feeling that it was falling a little bit short. You're just sustaining, you're not really contributing towards creating a more thriving community or broader um, ecosystem. And so this does show that it's kind of like sustainable is kind of the tipping point as we can move then towards more regenerative practices that are increasing um, their commitment to natural systems, holistic thinking, and also reducing the energy or material requirements. And maybe we will never arrive 100% at regenerative, but yet it's the idea of being on that path towards that direction. Here's another uh, model designed by Daniel Christopher Wall in this awesome book, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And I've included some reference slides at the end of this presentation. So this can be made available to the group for anybody that wants to dive into any of these resources further, but just an excellent introduction into um, regenerative thinking and design. And what I appreciate about his model too is really showing it as kind of more of a spiral. It's not just a, a direct line, but often is you know growth and recede and then grow again and a continual progression as you hope in that upward direction. Another group out of universe, uh, the University of International Cooperation out of Costa Rica is also developed yet uh, another model to help kind of convey that interconnectivity. We also often hear about regenerative practices in relationship to regenerative agriculture or restoration. But I think this helps to identify that it also connects back to these other realms as well, the economic, the political, the spiritual, and how in increasing that awareness about that connectivity can actually contribute towards greater innovation, but also greater um, capacity and impact. Um, some of you might be familiar with the donut economy. Um, uh, developed by Kate Raworth, an uh, economist out of the UK, who really wanted to do a dramatic shift in thinking about economics and why are they centered around um, expectation for continual profiting driven by uh, monetary wealth and why are we not instead centering instead of the GDP at the core of so much development instead center the, the earth. And in doing so, she helped to evaluate also where are we currently with our current you know, capitalistic structure falling short on so many basic needs and also exceeding um, 
you know, well beyond the ecological ceiling. And so she's done extensive mappings for what that could look like in different regions. And now there's also cities that are choosing to adopt. This is a practice of the city of Amsterdam is, is now adopting the donut economy. What that may look like is still will be interesting to see. Um, there is a group in California that recently formed to better understand how to be able to take this kind of theoretical uh, framework and now turn it into tangible action on the ground that may benefit uh, communities in a localized or at the statewide level in California. If any of you are interested in getting further involved, this again is a great way for active learning. I joined the group in California, they're receptive to outsiders to join. And so um, please get in touch with me or I can provide contact information to Kaylin for any of you that would like to get further involved. But as you can see with this diagram here, it really is again, trying to touch on a broad range of otherwise seemingly disconnected areas and remind us that there's this interrelationship between all of them and how we need to better understand what's that degree of impact that our current practices are having and where is that need for adjustment. In this case, everything from energy and housing also to social equity and gender equality and then extending beyond the ecological ceiling, everything from ocean acidification, ozone layer depletion, and of course, climate change. Carol Sanford is somebody who I would love to delve into much more of her work. She's a prolific um, thinker and writer in the regenerative space. She's got so much material on her uh, at her institute on her website. And um, I honestly speaking have not had a chance to read much of it, but I just was able to pull out one quote again, or encouraging all of you to take a closer look at this. But I think one of the concerns that she brings up is that you don't want to have, it's not necessarily that it's prescriptive, that regenerative thinking really should have a greater flexibility to it, that it's rather than like within LEAD where there's a very clear set of criteria that a building project must meet in order to receive that certification that within regenerative, it's really much more of applying a different lens in the way that we see the world. And so also really wanna embed that thinking within the development of this design tool. Are there opportunities to be able to establish certain metrics so a project could actually reach regenerative commitments from an ecological standpoint, but also allow some of the other kind of flexibility. So it's, um, allowing that kind of customization. And these are things that I would love to hear from all of you. Again, I am not at all familiar with uh, software development. So trying to understand what, you know, from a technical standpoint and so forth, are there ways to be able to create a form that can facilitate that, but allow for this kind of flexibility or fluidity. Here's an, yet another group to uh, clear who has uh, an extensive educational program at their website and has also developed a, here you can see the design graphic and then also uh, just some of the core areas that they identified that they, you know, have kind of touched upon already, but again, reemphasizing this is really about thinking about the whole and that there's strength from doing so rather than thinking about parts in isolation or in silo. Also respect for the uniqueness of place project, culture, whatever it may be. And I think this is really important to keep in mind too, a shift away from problem solving into the potential. What kind of world would we love to have? What could that start to look like? How do we strive more towards utopia if we know that, you know, at the same time that's impossible to achieve, but yet a desired destination to head towards? Being a service, really thinking about how we can strengthen community and move towards more collaborative um, efforts. And then also to shift away from the idea that humans are very separate from nature to better align so many of our practices with nature. They've also created their own, uh, another model too, that again, similar to some of the others, tries to identify some of the core domains to remember that there's a relationship. So in theirs, they've also included, you know, justice and respecting the limits and beauty and spirit. And all of these I see is taking inspiration from them and trying to figure out what then to incorporate into some type of online platform tool, again, to make it easier for projects to go above and beyond what they may have considered otherwise. Another is the circular economy. And again, many of you might be familiar with this, where it really thinks about that rather than a linear waste-based system to move into a more of a circular-based system that's really considering any quote waste and ensuring that that is put to use as well. So um, one of the differences that I personally found that that the circuit that differs between the circular economy and the regenerative 
uh, thinking, and this may differ from others, this is just my own personal interpretation, is that it's kind of still when contained. So it's trying to ensure that there's um, ample health throughout that circular system, but doesn't necessarily perhaps provide as many efforts towards the rippling out effect that the regenerative practices can do. How could a circular system also bring benefit to that which extends beyond its boundaries and have a rippling out effect? And there's a lot more information also at the circular economy at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, but I think, again, it's very much everything that we're looking to do is how do though have things function within that um, circularity? model circularity. Uh, permaculture, again, many of you might be aware of this, a practice that's been around for decades, um, have a number of principles that are very similar to what I'm finding within the regenerative thinking and practices. One I've always appreciated is stacking functions, both looking at how you can have a myriad of benefits coming from one of the actors within a space, but also understanding all of the, the different the relationships that that actor has to so too many to so many different other areas as well. So in this case, like what are the multiple benefits that come from a chicken, and but also what are the needs and how does it interface with other systems? And so and trying to understand things from utilizing bringing also in some of the permaculture principles such as the stacking functions. How can that continue to help us evolve what we think about in terms of regenerative practices. Also for those, uh, Kaylin was um, great in identifying a free year-long course for those that would like to learn more about permaculture with the Permaculture Women's Guild. Again, this information will be available for all of you at the end. Um, but just going back to the stacking function, something I think that would be great to have considered in the tool is this idea of some type of prompt encouraging people to think about if you've included an actor or a step are there additional benefits that can be gained from that different step in the way that it's designed or the way that it's utilized? And then again, another area that you might have heard about, uh, biomimicry, um, which is really trying to better understand how do we learn from 3.8 billion years of development and evolution and not just aligning our practices with nature, but really learning from nature. And it increases our respect for these natural systems, but also to use that as inspiration for development of innovation. And so again, a lot of information available on the biomimicry site for thinking through some of these different ways to consider. They also have their own training program on there. Um, how can we learn so much more than we are aware of now, or how can like, for example, one of the ideas they put forward is how could a city be more like a forest? And I think that's a really compelling idea to what does that then translate to on the ground? They have this amazing website called Ask Nature, which does go through hundreds of examples of deep research into different natural systems and organisms and animals and so forth and better understanding what are some of the principles and activities of those particular organisms and how they've also inspired particular solutions. And so, for example, a classic is like understanding the spider's web. What is that material? What is this? How did they get that strength? How can that understanding of that be employed into fabric development and um, or into industrial design, whatever it may be. And then while this isn't necessarily a framework uh, relationship to regenerative, it's certainly a key part of what we gain by moving in a more regenerative direction. We know that we're our, a number of urgent threats that we face right now, not just with climate change, but um, biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and so forth. And so there's a movement right now to really look at setting aside 30% of earth, including you know, land and water, for um, all other beings. And uh, that in doing so could allow for some of that biodiversity um, to reflourish. And I think that that should also be something that would be great to consider inclusion within the tool itself to remind us that this is really what in part we should be striving for as a goal, that we're helping all other species on this planet return to the state that they were in prior to this overwhelming impact that our species has had. 
And so uh, briefly go over the regenerative design tool concept. I thought it might be helpful to just as an example point to kind of what I'm hoping that this will do in looking at my own company, Nature Commode. So the intent of the company was really to provide service in terms of the portable toilets, but the second phase of the company was also to have a closed loop system. So all that I captured would be treated, the solids turned into a compost um, that would then be used as a soil amendment. The urine would be treated as a fertilizer and then that could be used in a um, in-house vertical farm operation that could grow uh, produce. So then the you know, fruits and vegetables could be made available back to the vendors that are back at the event and then be consumed by the attendees. And then basically those nutrients are cycled around and around. But I'm looking at um, some of the frameworks within regenerative thinking, it really wanted to try and extend that well beyond what I've conceptualized so far. So how could this provide additional prompts for where I could even continue to evolve a system such as this? And so the idea of having these growth rings that continue on out. So for example, the, the solids could be composted and used as nutrients to raise trees and a nursery and then those trees could go um, be fruit bearing trees and go to contribute towards an urban food forest that could benefit the community but also help with the heat island effect and carbon sequestration. The urine could go towards microbial fuel cells which could generate energy and then that energy could actually um, support the electricity needs at the event itself. Um, the nutrients could also go towards industrial hemp and we could grow crops to raise um, the hemp that could then be turned into fabric that could then go back to clad the toilets. So again, thinking like how to continue, have a tool that helps inspire this continual evolution of ideas. And so the breakout sessions really was hoping that then everybody <laughs> would feel inspired maybe from what you've heard so far or from your own personal practices to think through like what are some concerns and opportunities that you could see with developing a tool that included some of these components possibly or some other you know components as well from a form standpoint so as i shared above like it would be an online platform or it'd be open source the dashboard and so forth and again all of these will be included in the breakout sessions for reference also just in thinking about function ease of use how it can inspire setting uh, metrics how it can be um, customized for different types of projects. Could it work for a small farming operation or could it also work for small businesses or larger organizations? How could also include consideration to for the quadruple bottom line, moving us away in this idea of like post um, growth, really meaning in terms of getting beyond profits to the other benefits that it could bring. Uh, and then also, you know, what could be some of the objectives that the tool could help do in terms of helping to facilitate that holistic approach, again, the health of the participants, the health of the biodiversity, and so forth. And so then again, here's just some references at the end, and I'll stop sharing and go back to... Um, came yeah. in if... Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have the meet the breakout room set up and they're ready to go. Um, are there any questions before we go into the breakout room? What are the breakout rooms? Like, are they specific to topics or? I, I didn't yeah. So, uh, Nicole, how do you want to run that? Do you want everyone, each person to uh, each group to focus on one of the workshop elements or do you want everyone to try and tackle all of the the uh, not knowing the background and expertise of anybody, I think it'd be great if, you know, you have, there's just the three slides in there of the, you know, thinking about it think from a form and function standpoint and objectives, and then depending upon the dynamics of the group, if you want to focus based upon your own expertise, more upon one of those areas, that would be great. Or if you want to touch upon all of them, that would be awesome. This is really just intended as an opportunity to hear from all of you suggestions you may have about developing a tool along these lines, so. Okay, so then any other questions? I just wanted to share, maybe I sent this link earlier in the chat, but this there was like a press release just today of 
some research scientists and institutions, the 22 of them that partnered around the world to release a framework for sustainable biodiversity. And you might, it, you might want to just check into that. And they've, they've um, I think, spent a lot of time on it. it. might be something worth also looking into because you had all those mo different models. might be a good one as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Part of what I'm doing is just creating a library because there's so much activity yeah. happening in this space. And so it's so great. Thank you for sharing. Like, what else is emerging out there? And then, you know, what we're looking to do, could it help with that or not? Is there a gap or, you know, you. again, new to this? Yeah, for sure. And, and some of the projects too, it seems like they're really centered around what's happening within the physical or built space. And we're really interested as well as like, what about within the social space? How mm. can we have greater connectivity between the role of humans within strengthening community or also that better understanding, I guess, the social system um, component too. So that's mm. great. Cool. All right. So then um, I'll send a, a message in the chat here um, it says breakout rooms one through three, each group is going to have their own set of Google slides. Um, so you should be able to um, send me a chat um, at any point to let me know if you have any, any technical issues accessing those documents. Um, each breakout room will get, um, will have their own set of slides and you'll be able to edit in those slides. So you can work together. Um, someone can be chosen as the person that shares their screen. Um, and facilitates discussion. Um, and you'll just kind of go through each of those slides and um, just kind of talk it out, see, see what happens, see what ideas are. Um, if you have a lot of questions, sharing what those questions are. Um, and then there are also, like uh, Nicole was mentioning, there are the resources that she was sharing from her presentation um, in each of those uh, sets of slides. Um, and then we have one more person coming in from the waiting room. So I'll go ahead and assign him. So hi, Arthur, I'm gonna assign you to a breakout room. We're just about to uh, split off into those. Um, so let's see, make sure you're in one. Okay, so without further ado then, um, I will go ahead and start those off and um, I'll be hop hopping in and out throughout them um, just to see how things are going. So um, if you're having any technical issues, um, go ahead and send me a chat and Nicole is flagging me, I think. Oh, no really? So how long does, I mean, oh, right. do you want to just for, you know, like 10 minutes discuss or um, what do so, you So um, I, th I think we could do about 15 minutes um, and then it'll let you know at um, 120 seconds, so a minute and a half um, or two minutes before it ends, um, it'll start to warn you that it'll come back to, you'll come back to the main room. Um, and if we feel like we need more time to discuss, we can do that. Um, or you can go ahead and send me a chat at some point if we want to wrap it up a little bit early. Um, this is very experimental, um, this format and this topic. So just no worries if you if you want to wrap up or if you need more time, no worries. Just let us know what you're thinking. Anything else? All right. I had to step away for a second. So okay. my sincere apologies, but how do I know which breakout room I'm supposed to go to or will I like go on a magic carpet? I, I believe it is a magic carpet. I love that analogy. Um, you will be in room two um, just because I see your name in there. Um, and then once I click this button, open all rooms, everyone should be automatically allocated. Um, and I'm not sure if, um, if I'll have to do anything after that. So there might be a slight bump, but it, mostly for the, it should be a, a magic carpet, right? <laughs> okay, that's what how it works when I run it. I just wanted to make sure I, w I got confused when I saw the links. I was the like- The chat, right. Yeah, okay, so let me send out- um, Thank you. See if I can, I'll go into each room after it opens and make sure each room knows which one they are. Um, you, it, it might show you when you join it, but I'll make sure that um, you each have the link that you're supposed to be working in. I think I'll just get left in the lobby if I don't go to our room. So I think okay. we're good. Okay, good yeah. question. Anything else? Because I'm sure any questions will help everybody else too, so. So is the goal to build a tool or is it just to brainstorm different ideas? So the eventual goal, so we're in the early conceptualization phase of seeing could there be some type of online platform that could help facilitate 
new projects or, or existing organizations move more towards regenerative practices. And this is still like really early brainstorming as to what the components of the tool could look like. So how it could be designed from a form standpoint, from a functionality standpoint, but the intent would be still the development of an of a online platform tool. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but please feel free. And it really is meant to just be like that very early stages because maybe there's something already partially built out there. And I know that there's already a, a number of existing platforms, but could this be designed, like for example, designed in such a different way where the form helps facilitate the regenerative thinking. So rather than maybe even linear information, maybe the information already appears in a circle or a dial or some of those things I'd love to hear from those of you who do do design that then to think through how the regenerative principles could help inform the form of the tool itself as an example. So. Okay, anything else before I send you on your magic carpet? <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna press the button um, and then I'll, I'll hop into each of the rooms and make sure you have um, your, your Baker Up Room um, link there. So go, go forth. <laughs> Um, okay, so welcome back to the main room, everybody. Um, I hope that the breakout rooms were um, some fun and that you got to meet new people. Um, I am looking for- Nicole. We lost Becky though. I hope she's back. Yeah. Oh, oh good, I, here, yeah. I see her there. I hope she comes, oh, I see- I'm back. I yeah. pressed the oh, button I accidentally. I thought that's what happened. <laughs> I was like, no. it was I just like a user error. There's a button in front of me. <laughs> I just have to let Nicole back in. I think she did the same thing. Oh man, it's like you're still on me, and Nicole. But you, you don't like, even really read what it says. You're just like, oh, there's a button. I got a yeah. press. Right yeah, there. You know, but it was right in the middle of your happening. I know. Break break I'm so, so sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll if I'll follow up later. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to catch um the last of Holly's notes too. Am I missing Holly? No, there she is. So I was trying to, we started a new slide in our group and um, there was like five seconds left and she was talking about personas and I was like trying to type it all out. But um, so I think um, we could possibly do another session, but I wonder, um, Nicole, if you'd want to have a, um, like a representative from each group share um, what their, their group came up with. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Again, thank okay. you everybody so much for joining into this tonight. So. Yeah, so um, breakout room one, um, if you all know who you were, would you like do a little wave? Yeah, I think that would have been Nicole's group. Becky oh, yeah. <laughs> should be the Oh, group. okay. Yeah. Do you want to share, uh, Becky, and I'm sorry, is it Diria? Diria? Diria. Yeah. Diria yeah. or Marisol, do either of you want to share like some of the ideas that you're, you're mentioning? Like Becky, you were mentioning about a couple of things like in terms of uh, from a form standpoint about the 3D and also the voice. <laughs> yeah, I was just um, I was just suggesting like from an interface point of view, it would be quite cool if you did something that um, it's kind of hard to t explain, but basically it was like a type of interface that was that built knowledge based on um, people's inputs. So like when you started the interface and you were talking about a project that you were going to um, embark on that it would start to ask you questions and collect knowledge from you based on the regenerative um, kind of cycle of thought. So you could enter it from any one of those points talking about what you're attempting to do and then it would ask you questions and build knowledge and possibly integrate other people or types of thought into it to build kind of a like a profile or like a personal kind of knowledge base of that project and it could be it could be like it could be presented in any number of ways like it could be presented in a traditional way but it could also be presented as like a, a vr interface so it feels mm -hmm. felt spatial like something that mm -hmm. you were in 
involved walking around and, and you had, you know, that it encourages like 360 thinking, or mm. it could also be like, um, I was talking about how there's a kind of philosophy of a no interface interface, which mm. is basically like it leverages more the power of voice and those, those type of interactions that are just quite natural that we don't think about as an interface to collect information and provide information back. So that was just an idea. So I don't know if I explained it the same way as I did. <laughs> I think that's cool because it sort of helps, it would help the person kind of think through their ideas as well. You know, yeah, it's kind of like getting feedback, mm -hmm. a feedback structure. So I, wonder, you, I was just asking, uh, Becky, were you kind of thinking like conceptually like a reverse choose your own adventure? in the sense where like, rather than feeding the storyline, like they're triggering the next stage of development to kind of help them wrap through the process, but based off of that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Like, yeah, so like, it's almost, it might not be this literal, but it's literal, but it's almost like thinking, have you thought about this, right? Or have you thought about it from this perspective, right? And kind of, using that regenerative, those different regenerative um, models as like almost uh, influencers, you know? Yeah, it's almost like you have your own personal regenerative designer on your team. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> consultant. It's like a regenerative design consultant almost, but it's thinking from all these different mindsets. That'd be awesome. Everybody would do it. They'd be like, be so easy. sign me up, sign me up. <laughs> And then Melissa, I think I saw you come off mute and you were going to add something. Did I get that right? Oh, no, I was just saying like how, it, you know, a friend of mine were joking about like the perfect partners, like someone who asks questions. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Like you mean in life, like your, your person, yeah, somebody who asks questions. Yeah, that's true. Like, what do you mean by that? Yeah. yeah <laughs> that, not just, that's uh -huh. psychologist <laughs> Not speaking from personal experience or anything. Okay. Um, did anyone else have any thoughts on uh, Becky's idea? Okay. Maybe were there any other uh, standout ideas from breakout room one? I think you're really talking about like um, Dara. Also, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, Daria. Daria. Yeah. Daria also, I think, helped provide a concrete example of trying to, she's joining a commission with the city regarding transportation. Sounds like Daria. So, <laughs> to think through like how you could design something again for uh, customization for multi-uses. So maybe it's not just for a small business. Maybe in that case, it's for helping a larger municipality think through one component that they are currently reevaluating what that design could look like. So, and ensuring that their mm -hmm. solution regarding transportation could also address all the other areas that are gonna be impacted by their decisions. That actually relates really closely to, I believe I was in group breakout room two, um, breakout room two wave. Yes, okay, I got it right. Um, I don't know why that's been tough for me, but I, I know the numbers now. Um, so breakout room two, Holly, if I can put you on the spot, we were talking about personas and the importance of just defining your users and who you're serving. Um, would you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I'm a user experience researcher and in the project development life cycle, I'm on the front end, hopefully there's a user experience researcher in that process, that's not always the case. And then um, when that doesn't happen, then there's a lot of 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 until somebody's like, oh, we should have someone do user testing, not just user acceptance testing, but like actually talk to the people who use it. So the thing that I'm really curious about, yeah, thank you. Um, the thing that I'm really curious about, that was my pitch for my people, uh, is you know exactly who are the target users and what is the problem statement exactly and, and being really clear on that. So if we borrow from design thinking principles, the first step would be to empathize. And so that means who is our user? Do we 
Do we need to have one or two or three personas to kind of, you know, they're generalizations. It's a, a caricature of a person, but it does give you some direction when you're thinking as you're moving through the project to reflect back like this persona represents our real users. And hopefully that's grounded in some data and you're doing some real research if you don't have the data and it could be on the street or surveys within existing communities, but I think it would be a misstep to not get clear on what is the problem that we're trying to solve and exactly guerrilla research. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Who are our users? And then the next thing would be a how might we statement. So how might we solve the problem for our user? And that's where we get to ideate and get really kind of wild with our ideas about how we might do that. And that's when you go check in with the users again. And what do you guys think about that? And then you do some cheap pr prototypes. Yeah, and then you test it. Yep, good yeah. idea. Those do you have any? Oh, really, go ahead. I was just gonna say that's really good advice. Um, maybe maybe Daria is the first um, test person. Yeah, with your transportation <laughs> the initiative. First, the, first, the first market. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wouldn't mind that. And one of the things that we talked about in our group, just to add to that, was by creating this. Um, this welcome, this low threshold that like everybody would want to do, then you reach stakeholders that maybe you wouldn't normally that you actually really need to get their input. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's a really great idea. So if, Terry, now we're putting you on the spot <laughs> again. <laughs> um, if you were to use this tool, what would be really important to you? What would be kind of some key needs that we, you would need to solve by this tool? But the hardest thing that I think of right now as a commissioner on this uh, transportation and, and mobility commission is actually, you know, the whole thing about being inclusive is not just actually what um, was it was it Michelle that just said this um, or Holly Holly you just said this it's not just getting acceptance like it's either you get to pick between A and B. But true inclusivity is getting people engaged on the the most um, fundamental, um, you know, foundational level of not just how you create something, but how you make the decisions. And so to me, I think that um, it's, it's reaching people where they are. You know, I also work at the library and right now the people that need us the most who are, you know, who like don't have the internet or can't, don't have access to the computers, we, we're struggling with how, how to serve the people who need us most. And so to, to serve the people that need it most would be the answer to that, Kaylin, yeah. So then Nicole or Terry or um, Melissa, the, the folks at the Mobius Collective, does that inspire any questions from you? Anything that um, you could follow up on, on that? Well, I think it'd be cool if the tool could really better embrace knowing that, well, could this be used for a variety of groups? But I think some of the ideas that Becky was suggesting, like how could the form help facilitate that, you know, for those groups that are not even identifying what their core problem is, could, the, could you embed some of that user experience framework in to build it into the tool itself? That would enable saying like, hey, have you ensured? So it's almost like there's the maybe it's more designed for a project manager in some respect where there's still going to be somebody leading or utilizing the tool, but ensure that they are accurately engaging the community that they should be connecting with for their solution, or that everybody is seeing. I was trying to sketch things out where like you have actors, but maybe some are higher level actors, lower level or more active actors and less active actors, but everybody's still understood to be an actor in the space and that everybody still has something to con contribute towards it. So like the idea of the city is revising things around mobility, but how is the, the residents of Portland also become actors in that space in a different way that they would have a chance to inter inter in engage with the platform? That's what I was thinking when Daria was talking also, um, you know, I've been thinking recently about like representation in government and for obvious reasons <laughs> and, um, you know, just how 
things kind of unfold in government and like, you know, the people who actually make the decisions and um, if they're representative of the people. And I was thinking like when Daria was talking about that, that it's interesting because a lot of times when projects happen in local communities, there's like a commission or whatever that kind of formulates it. And then they come up with a proposal that gets kind of approved and then it gets ex and then it gets like publicized and then the public's allowed to give feedback. But what you might be able to do is actually get the public to be in the ideation stage instead of the do we like it or not stage. You know, because a lot of times in just any team in general, if you wait till the do you like it or not stage, everybody's like picking out all the problems, you know, but if they feel like they were part of the ideation of the solution there, you, you get better results and you get a community of people to um, support it. Right. So maybe and I do see um, that, Holly wants to add something to that too. Once you wrap up your thought. Oh, Holly or something. Oh, uh, now I don't know how to unraise my hand. Oh, there we go. So I was just saying, I think it would be really important to identify some key stakeholders and think about, you know, whatever, like what um so that you can better identify what your problem space is so you can then forward thinking what is the solution it doesn't add a lot of value to make assumptions about what users need and build something without talking to them and so we can think that people want all this stuff but then when we actually go talk to them, whoops, we made a lot of assumptions that weren't necessarily, like we all bring our bias to the table. Maybe we're really passionate about something. So we think that something that would be important to everyone else. And that's not necessarily what's most needed. Um, I'm really involved in street outreach in St. Louis and have been for almost a decade. And I did a lot of guerrilla research during my street outreach. And we had a lot of incoming donations that were given with all the best of intentions, but nobody ever talked to us to find out what we needed. And it ended up actually causing a strain on our resources and becoming a problem for us to solve because we had all this stuff that we couldn't use. And then we had to make the decision do we throw it away because we don't have time to deal with it or to find a volunteer? Or can we, in the zero amount of minutes we have, try and source volunteers and agencies that could take this stuff? It, it became a cluster. Like someone donated a coach wallet. I'm sure they meant well, but that's not something someone on the street needs. Or maybe they thought we would sell it, but we don't, we're grassroots. We don't have time for that kind of stuff. So I think those are like a couple examples I can think of off the top of my head of like those cognitive missteps from the other side, but the same thing can happen for us that we can assume we know what the user needs and we really don't. And so I, to me, identifying who your key stakeholder groups are would be paramount in my, in my opinion. Anyone have anything to add on to that? Yeah, I think for group three, I'll just jump in. We have stakeholders. Yeah, go for it. We have stakeholders. So yeah. <laughs> so um, so our group uh, focused on thinking about the context first and specifically the Northwest as a receptive community to regenerative thinking and specifically um, locating some of the larger organizations like Nike and Intel, who um, at least have had talk about this kind of stuff over the years, whether it's true or not, I'm in Pittsburgh. But, um, but so what if 
these organizations created a community conversation and developed a roster of organizations and contacts um, that would create a um, sort of a hub that would encourage interest and start a conversation in the community. So the community becomes the stakeholder and the organizations become the facilitator. Um, cool idea. And I would say that one of the coolest ideas I thought from this talk was um, when the question came up, like, but how do you measure impact on the projects that the company and the community and people are sort of positing to have regenerative practices? And um, the discussion went to impact being measured sort of like using that framework of nature commode and the life cycle points and those gates. And how could you measure in, this, in these community projects like at each level? Is it going regenerative or is it going, you know, back to degenerative? Almost like following so I, along those spirals, right? From Daniel Kahn, is that his name? Yeah, from the spirals and the, you know, when you start to roll something out, like at each, at each turn, basically you would measure. So I thought that was really cool. Um, it, is there other things, team, that you guys remember? Can the group three wave at me again? I wanted to see who was all in there. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find the mute button. I'm so on team so much. I'm off Zoom. Relatable. Stephanie, I don't see Stephanie right now, but she was pretty vocal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, and part of this was giving the idea of encouraging businesses to have more regenerative um, behaviors. So it's encouraging the re and celebrating those regenerative behaviors. Any degenerative behaviors will even be stopped or even better be replaced by regenerative behaviors and how to encourage that and give support, get support for the community and, uh, and resources with that. And one thing that I didn't see a lot in the, in the regenerative models, but I think would work well in this scenario is transparency. Um, because then people can learn and can see like, oh yeah, that kind of sucked. That didn't work, but you know, the next one we can try it again. That reminded me of something. Could you say that the keyword one more time, see if it comes back to me? I forgot what I thought of. What of, transparency? The key of transparency oh, no. yeah yeah it was transparency i don't remember what i was watching it was some sort of documentary but um they were trying to encourage this one particular street um so it's all these houses along kind of like a new orleans style street where the the no, houses are really narrow and the porches everyone can come out and see this one st narrow street um and as they're trying to encourage each of the households to recycle more um transparency they drew in chalk I think it was um the progress of each household I think it was um and so each household could see how much they were recycling and so there was like a clear transparent view of uh, like there's like the social behavior change aspect where you could see oh my neighbor's recycling more than me I should catch up and just like as a whole seeing um that like your your whole street's contributions to this this group effort making you feel like you're part of something more. Um, I wonder if there's kind of like, and, and then a similar project to, um, with, um, what is it called? It's like urban design, but a uh, future focus. I don't remember what it's called at the moment. Smart cities. So they'll, they'll um, on like street corners, they'll have different um, metrics displayed for everyone to see um, like on the city's progress. So I wonder if there's, I think um, Nicole and I had talked about dashboards um, so somehow um, facilitating, facilitating the collection of certain data points and then also um, giving whoever these users are, um, maybe they're um, stakeholders on a government initiative, um, maybe giving them a plugin that they can use on their website to share the data that they collect um, through whatever this tool is 
Um, that's a cool idea. Yeah, it's getting my gears turning a little bit. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. It could also like, you could, if you did it well, you know, it could become like a thing of we use this tool in our process. And that would be like a certification almost on its own right that, you know, kind of a 360 regenerative approach to how we, how we uh, went about unfolding this project and came to this result, which would be quite cool. And then those people could also provide information um, on the process. You know, that's one of the, I think um, one of the, I'm a big fan of user research. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, that's, it's really important. Um, sometimes what I've found in my career is that I've had to actually do something and you have to be really smart about how you do something in order to not spend tons of money doing something that's incorrect. Um, if you don't do user research, but sometimes you get the best research by doing a little bit and then getting somebody to tell you if you completely missed the mark or if it seems interesting, right? If you're on, does this, is this seem, seem to be working or is this, and when you're starting out in a new project, a lot of times I think something like this is really important to um, build enthusiasm and engagement. And one way to do that is to create a vision for what you think it might be. And then even if it's not completely end up being that, which it probably won't, um, you've people developed, star. yeah, you've developed and you've developed a group of people invested in it, you know, and they'll help you steer it to what it needs to be. Which is something, oh, go ahead, Holly. Oh, I was going to say, I totally agree. And the idea of having like, what is our minimum viable product or minimum delightful experience? Like what's that initial yeah. thing going to look like? So that's where you prototype, test, iterate. So you build the cheap, cheap prototype. I mean, it could be like literal drawings on paper. So you, you um, test cheap, test often, right? And then so defining, okay, so here, Here's our MVP. This is like, this is our 1.0. Then what would we consider the next level? Then what's the level after that? And I think to um, rewind a little bit too about the benchmarks, I think that's where a combination of SMEs and stakeholders, so those subject matter experts can help define benchmarks that matter Definitely. And then also talking to the users about what benchmarks are meaningful to them, which ones do they value, you know, um, and the combination of subject matter experts like Terry and real users that are likely to be using this product along with stakeholders who have a vested interest in seeing that minimum viable product built you know, you can make a short list of, of things that can be measured and that can always grow over time. You can MVP benchmarks, but I love dashboards, but they can also get ridiculous. You know, you want, people don't want to look at a bunch of stuff. So what are, what's the like critical mass? Like what are, what are the critical points that people want to see? And then maybe we'll investigate the other stuff later. Maybe it's only like three things. It might only be couple things, but we, we don't know if we don't ask. I think a good place too to start is kind of what you're doing right now on this design study night is a imagine if kind of, you know, like imagine if we built this tool that would help guide projects to be regenerative, you know? And what you've done here is you've gotten a whole bunch of people to tell you what they thought of when, if they imagined that. And I think like, 
I don't know what your plan is for how you want to do this. Like, you know, if you want to get investment on it, or if you want to, you know, just kind of like see what happens and think of ideas and then wherever they go, you know, start talking to people. Um, but um, that's kind of a, I think that's a good place to start. And then it'll help lead you to like what Holly's saying, you know, in software, if you don't have any experience in software, MVP is a very important term. <laughs> um, and you need to really, that when, when you start to get people excited about what you're doing and they're like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Tell me more. They're going to go, okay, how are you going to do this? Right. And that's where it's going to be really important to be able to say, this is our plan and this is what it's going to take. Um, and if you don't do that, I've witnessed myself, many teams, organizations, businesses, groups of humans end up in, you know, deep holes because they didn't do that bit. But um, I think this bit is the, in my opinion, this part right here is the most exciting <laughs> because you're like, what if there was right. a, super you know, and you're way. like, oh, you're joking. Oh my God. Okay. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. So I, I love that we have a lot of this. Um, so in, in design, we talk about the double diamond where you diverge and you converge, um, which is related to a concept in like the I Ching, um, mm -hmm. where you inhale and exhale with the bellows, you inhale, mm -hmm bring in all this creative inspiration. And then you're like, wait, hold on. I have to make it practical and then push it out, test it, discover, see how it goes and yeah. then refine from there. So it's this awesome process of just like in and out swiveling. If you ice skate, just to swivel. Yeah, that's so, a cool way to talk about it too. Yeah, I, I'm actually doing a talk on this um, later this week. I'm a busy, busy gal. Um, no, but that's one of the concepts that I find is super applicable and makes everyone really comfortable with like, no, it's okay to explore. And then, yeah, we do need to bring it back in and it's okay to explore it. And then just have, that's the normal process is to go back and forth. Sometimes um, people can be. Well, that's what we do in life. That's nature. Right. Too. Like you're talking about yeah, repetitive design. That is what it is basically, you know, like the pushing pull between the like, spiral too. Yeah. It's like, it's circular. It's like, I get it now. You know, it's a circle. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Cool. So Nicole has a question. Oh, just real quick. I was just going to say, um, I'm responding to that, that yes, we're still at such an early stages that that's kind of the hopes of like, hey, let's just go, why, where are the crazy ideas that people may come up with, knowing that it has to come back to be more grounded, understand the stakeholders. But at this point, it's like, wow, could it just go off in this totally different direction, you know, that would never assume that would be the way that you would design a regenerative tool? You know, what if you started from, you know, video gaming? What if you started from AR within or, you know, experience design? I mean, all these other areas that don't seem like they are directly connected to what you would expect this type of tool to be designed. You know, I don't know. So it's really wanted to go as wide as possible to see what's out there. Like, I love hearing about, like, you know, you mentioned about the, um, the no interface interface. Like, that's amazing. What could that suggest? And so I think, yeah, it's still trying to capture all of those possible. Well, also things. there's some, so you know, there's some in just Portland area, there's some um, organizations and I think they're actually quite connected to 52 Limited, but um, that are innovating in that space. So, you know, you never know somebody might be interested in exploring what could be done there, you know, like um, the wild or um, I can't think of who else off the top of my head, but, um, yeah, but th those tools are all about like collaboration and design in the different paradigm. Right. So if, if you would imagine that if your tool became like a VR type experience or something where it's spatial or it's, you know, voice and spatial or something like that. And it's kind of like a imagination station of regenerative design that could be quite cool who are that so there's groups in portland you mentioned that then yeah there's well there's a company called the wild um there's some other ones too but um they they make a art they make a product that's for um design it's for architects and, and interior designers to do like and actually more than that they work with nike and stuff too so like they do um 
like you can all come into a space and work on a design and like look at things in 3D and like talk about them and design it in the space, right? And collaborate in the space. I'll send a link to the their website in the chat. We had yeah. actually done an event last year, I believe it was, um, bringing in someone from Torch, which I believe is no longer an yeah, active they, company. Yeah, they got acquired or bought in. Okay, um, maybe by Wild. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, those people too might be interesting to talk to as as you as you explore. Um, but it would be it'd be it'd be quite fun to just have a maybe you might have a similar brainstorming session like this with people that are in the spatial design space or something. And if you have more of these brainstorming sessions, I'm there for that. <laughs> That's great. So fun. So awesome. Was there also, was there a fourth group too, or was it the three? Uh, yeah, it was the three. Um, and I did want to ask um, if um, some of the folks like Casey um, and Marisol um, and Amina and Jillian, I know that a couple of you've been sending, and Heather as well, um, you've been chatting in uh, the chat there. But um, if you all wanted to share out um, on the, and come off mute if you wanted to, um, did you want to share any ideas that you you came up with? No worries if not. I was in group three and okay. Well, we were just trying to like put together a grasp of like how and who would use it. So we came up with like the local business thing and like some key concepts for just a place where uh, you can create projects or and then create involvement. So. Um, like, and then I was thinking like combining it too, because you want it to be informational as well. So it's like facilitating anyone who wants to create their own project. So it's like a facilitating website that will help you. And then I really like the idea of tracking it and just like, and we were like, how do we track that? And, you know, even as simple as something that's regenerative is like a plus mark. And then if it's like degener degenerative, like, um, because it can't be avoided like in your everyday business practice or whatever, like that would be a minus. So with the transparency thing, I think that's cool to like put it into real time and like try to give you a perspective of how to track your project or whatever it may be, you know? Yeah, as you guys were talking about transparency, I started to think about how cool it would be for the transparency to be also regenerated, to be less about like, just showing the inadequacy of being degenerative, but rather than inviting the community to pick it up. And, you know, like if you do something, if you have a project and it doesn't end up being, you know, spawning something new, but it just kind of like lingers maybe, and it got a minus, maybe that would be an invitation for then people to kind of do something again, instead of transparency just being like a yeah, maybe like if you did get marked as like, you know, a degenerative practice, like let that be a jumping off point in the community to brainstorm together and see what you could do to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, since people are starting to drop off a little bit, I do want to keep the discussion going. And I saw Jillian came off mute. So I do want to hear your thought. Um, uh, Nicole, before people have to drop off. Do you want to share a little bit about some next steps and how people can stay in touch with you after this event? And then we can we can come back to Jillian's note. I just want to make sure that everybody catches it if they have to leave. Uh, yes, you you know, what's the best way to make the um, my contact information available to everybody or if anybody would be interested in additional brainstorming sessions again, just to you know, <laughs> reiterate, this is still at such the early stages. So um, yeah. I guess, I mean, thank you so much again for everybody joining in the conversation today. And I guess just hoping to kind of continue the very early conceptualization phase for at least another month or so. Um, and maybe say like over the next two months, just really kind of staying very broad as to what this could look like and capturing insight from different um, channels. So if anybody would like to stay, participate in additional brainstormings or just, you know, providing feedback, uh, that would be awesome. And my uh, direct email, my Gmail is at the end of the presentation. 
Yeah, so I just sent um, the MobiusCollective.org website in the chat, and then um, Nicole uh, Coos, uh, so C-O-U-S, um, at gmail.com is, is your email address if you wanted to um, do that. And then uh, Amina, I, I can send you an invitation to the um, Slack channel for Women Who Code. We don't have a Slack, Slack channel for this Mobius okay. Collective group yet. Um, and who else is the Me Too? Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Give me one second. Okay. Oh, okay. I have to keep track of everybody who does the Slack. So I will, I will send that out. Um, let me see if I can also grab the Slack link from here. Um, if you all are comfortable using the um, sign up link yourself, I can send a link to that. It's a bit.ly, um, like bit.ly link that we typically use. Let's see. Can I just say something really quick? Um, yeah, go for it. Hi, been, um, I've been thinking, where have I met you? <laughs> um, I attended one of the, I think you were a speaker at one of the Kai Fu meetings. So. Um, I, I've been to a, Kai, a few Kai Fu meetings. Um, um, or Becky. Was, Becky, but, yes. Oh, yeah, so Becky is where, that's where oh, I met yeah, Becky. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talked about... Um, I think it was humans, humans. something about humans. Yeah. <laughs> it was excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I'm a, I really enjoyed that. That was a cool, or, they're a cool organization, but, but mm -hmm. uh, team. Well, this is um, just for my own personal opinion. This has been really cool. Um, I don't I actually interact with many, very many people outside of my own little small team of work. So, and I was thinking of like, should I attend? Because I was feeling like, you know, sometimes when you're in isolation, you start to isolate even more. <laughs> so I was, sometimes I feel that way. I don't know about you guys, but it was really nice to interact with a bunch of people around ideas and especially ideas that benefit the planet and um, kind of making our world better, you know, so. I want to personally thank everybody for doing that. And thank you, Nicole, and your team for taking on a project that is beneficial to everybody. And I mean, not just humans, everybody. <laughs> yeah, all the animals. <laughs> yeah, the plants, the animals, and everything that keeps us alive. Okay, so um, yes, I totally vibe with that. Um, so I just sent uh, the, the bit.ly link in the Slack chat to join the Women Who Code Portland channel. Um, and then maybe Nicole and I can, um, we'll, I'll save the, the chat as like a text file. So we'll go back through and see all the collaboration that happened in there and collect all of the email addresses. And we can facilitate maybe starting a Slack channel or a related community around this effort. Um, just maybe we can collect everybody all in the same space, even if you don't wanna join the Women Who Code Slack channel, or if you're already a member of it, you can also join the, um, one a little bit more focused around the regenerative design community. Um, and then we had Jillian, are you still on? If you wanted to share your idea and then after you go, um, I wanna hear from Holly as well. I see her hands up. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I was thinking, looping back to kind of what um, Becky was talking about in relationship, I think to like VR stuff, um, but combining that with like the machine learning element of um, like predictive advertisement in, um, creating some kind of story concept similar to what we were talking about before of where if you have a user or like a bunch of random people or even like a, a guerrilla marketing concept of going to people um, and having people kind of walk through an experience because I think one of the downsides is a lot of people don't really understand what uh, regenerative design is and what that could be in their life until they experience it or, un or see the process. But to be able to have that as sort of a very tangible sort of VR, VR experience where they're actually choosing their process through a guided story um, and cool interacting with, with yeah. these things. But also on the other side of that built in, you have the machine learning data points where you're then tracking like, okay, how many people chose this route in the story and how many people kind of repeatedly went back to these sort of types of things and begin to learn about how people interact with this concept, um, what the user wants and needs from the regenerative design. Um, and I think the more 
you do that, the more you can gain that data, those data points to be able to build out whatever it is that you're looking for. So even some like prototype development to kind of get the storyline going so people are interacting with it to then develop upon that um, as a learning tool would be really yeah. useful. You know what I really love about that idea is that you're basically what you're kind of talking about building is an ex an experience for designing an experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, and it's and it's earth centric. Like it's a it's a it's a a methodology, but it's gone beyond a methodology. It's it's an actual experience to creating a positive experience. That's really cool. That's a really way, really compelling way to approach it. And I think that's awesome too, because it really gets at some of the difficulties in sustainability planning. And they'd say like, well, really, what am I going to get from this? What are we going to gain from like, you know, supposedly like supporting, you know, local food or you know, yeah, people just see things in, in isolation of their own limited life experiences. They don't understand the rippling effect that these things can have. You know, my dad, like, why buy cage-free eggs? Who cares about the chickens? I'm like, well, there's this relationship. And it, why, and I think providing and realizing that so much of this is still having to connect with us as emotional beings and providing that, even if it was a VR experience, I think would start to tap into that emotional connectivity that people could start to see like, wow, you mean it's multiple benefits that could be gained from this pathway, you know? Yeah, you're almost like, you're almost introducing them to the stakeholders right? Like it's kind of like um, experiential user research for the people doing the projects. It's like, hey, meet the stakeholder. You, whatever it is you're doing, there's all these stakeholders in it. And here's the story about them, you know, so they start to understand and make, like you said, emotional decisions based on how it impacts those different things. That's really cool. That, that would be really powerful. I like all of the different perspectives from all around um, that we're getting. So I did want to make sure that we covered Holly's question. Oh, right. Um, I just have like two super quick things. One, where can I get the slide deck so I can see what I missed? Right. Let me send that. Okay. Are you okay if I send that out, Nicole? Or do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then second point. I promise I won't distribute it on Facebook. <laughs> I don't know. I have a trench coat full of PowerPoint presentations and Google Slides. Oh dear. <laughs> sell it on the corner. Um, and then the other thing is I would just like for myself to close with a call to action to think about inclusivity and how we could um, one, make this group as inclusive as possible but also looking at within the sustainability community, how, how could we potentially extend the reach to groups that are typically marginalized and ex excluded from sustainability activities? I imagine that Portland isn't probably very different from St. Louis and that um, usually the lower down the socioeconomic scale you go, the less likely you are to have exposure to these kinds of ideas. And so we're very fortunate here to have some folks who have invested in um, marginalized communities and low income communities who've started beekeeping programs for young people and things like that. But um, so that's my call to action to think about how how could we be intentionally inclusive for users, subject matter, experts, stakeholders to make sure that the sustainability community as a whole continues to be more inclusive over time? I love that. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Okay, so we are at uh, 724, so we have a, a few minutes left to um, to wrap up here. And I know there's a lot of energy about wanting to connect afterwards. So I'm going to make sure that I save the chat and reach out to everybody that was interested in learning more. Um, so if you haven't already and you are interested, um, go ahead and share your um, email address in the chat. Um, if you've already done that, I'll have it on file and I'll pass those to Nicole and the Mobius team. 
Um, and I'll also reach out to everybody who had to hop off a little bit early through the meetup page um, and make sure that they um, uh, have the opportunity to join in on whatever these next steps are. Um, thank you, Casey. Um, so then, uh, Nicole, I'll pass it off to you and see if there's any any last words, any last remarks. Just a huge gratitude to everybody. Thank you so much for you know all of your great ideas. And I mean, this is just really at the early stages. So thank you, thank you. And would love to keep the conversations going with whoever would like to. <laughs> keep working on this space with us. So, or you know, see if like maybe in a couple months come back to a uh, woman who code PDX and share whatever's been developed to get more feedback, or mm -hmm. really still at the very early stages of embarking on this. So, super. Kind yeah. Of thank you so much to you too, Nicole. If we can uh, do some snaps or claps to thank to our speaker. Thank you so much for putting together that that presentation. Um, some jazz hands. Thank you, Marisol. Um, so that was a wonderful uh, slide you, deck that you put together. Um, so much information, but um, uh, 52 Limited, Elaine, our representative from there was saying that there was so much information on the slides, but you actually, you talked through it. Um, so it was really easy to relate to. And I think that we all kind of feel like at least we got our boots on with the regenerative design concepts. Um, and I think um, that everyone here had a lot to contribute. So thank you so much for staying on with us. Um, and we'll we'll hopefully talk to you again soon. We'll we'll see what 2021 brings us for the regenerative design uh, tool. Thank so you. thank you everybody. Have a great night and we will be in touch. See you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>